Good morning. I'm Dr. Nick Cutris, Program Director and Pediatric Endocrinologist at Stanford University. Once again, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending from where you're joining. Uh, thank you for joining our program and for being a champion for diabetes care in your community. Uh, we're grateful for the unrestricted educational grants that we received from Novo Nordis and Pfizer Inc. that make this program possible. Our goal is to address the urgent needs of patients living with type 1 and type 2 diabetes who require complex diabetes treatment in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. We want to empower our primary care providers and clinics to safely and effectively manage underserved patients who do not have routine access to specialty diabetes care. Even before COVID-19 pandemic, outcomes for patients with diabetes were suboptimal, to say the least. Data from 191 million people enrolled in health plans that report HEDIS results to the NCQA illustrate system failure for patients with diabetes. In 2018, less than one-third of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes had A1C values of 7% or less. And even more concerning, 30 to 40% of patients had A1C values of greater than 9%. We must recognize that these outcomes do not reflect patient noncompliance, but rather system failure. Minimizing hyperglycemia is paramount to reducing diabetes patient risk and vulnerability to infection and complications, including COVID-19. Now is an opportune time to overcome therapeutic inertia and make meaningful system changes so that patients are able to achieve glycemic targets. We are living in unprecedented times with COVID-19, but systemic racism and health inequalities have been endemic to the U.S. COVID-19 is making these injustices more clear. We must come together as a medical community and change our practice. We must act. When the mortality rate from COVID-19 in Black Americans is at least two times, if not five times, as high as the mortality rate for whites, we must act. When marked racial disparities in diabetes management exist and prior to COVID-19, we must act. When Black Americans with diabetes with equivalent socioeconomic status as white Americans are less likely to be prescribed intensive insulin management regimens and diabetes technologies proven to improve diabetes outcomes, we must act. We must act and recognize systemic racism and implicit bias that are also occurring within our medical community. Our leadership and faculty are committed to promoting health equity through our program and combating systemic racism in the U.S. We are, commuted. we are committed to action. Here at Stanford, we're partnering with Project ECHO and other sites across the U.S. on this series. Project ECHO is a globally recognized health and spoke outreach model developed at the University of New Mexico to reduce disparities and improve health outcomes in patients who otherwise lack routine specialty care. Zoom-based clinics led by multidisciplinary faculty from academic medical centers and community organizations provide providers with education, case-based learning, and expertise that they need to treat patients within their own community. Our presentation agenda will uh, 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 be responding to questions from last week, a lecture followed by a submitted case presentation from the community, and then we'll address some of the pre-submitted questions our audience members uh, submitted during registration. A few housekeeping um, items and logistics. Uh, please use the Q&A feature um, to submit questions. Uh, use the chat box to make uh, recommendations and sharing uh, best practice resources. We'll try our best uh, to address all of your questions submitted through the registration and chat. However, if we're unable to, please um, come back again another week and register for next week. This webinar is being recorded and the lecture portion of this webinar will be available in a few weeks on our website. The case presentation from today will not be included on the webinar. Our web development team is working to build a resource library on COVID-19 where session materials will be found. After the webinar ends, you'll be emailed an evaluation that will enable you to claim continuing education credit. Our ECHO webinar is a safe Space for everyone. We have a zero tolerance par, uh, policy for language that is discriminatory, disrespectful, racist, sexist, bullying, or offensive. We'll not tolerate cyberbullying. As such, any participant will be removed from the webinar if you engage in any such behavior. Thank you for keeping our ECHO a safe space for everyone. We have an uh, exciting series yet to come um, with excellent and relevant topics. As a reminder, uh, you and others are welcome to drop in for any one of these sessions. 
Next week, we'll be featuring Dr. Ann Peters um, as, we, as she talks about um, DT, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and SGLT inhibitor therapies in the time of COVID-19. We are fortunate to have a, um, an unbelievable uh, faculty from uh, 13 different uh, sites, um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can um, introduce them. Um, and I'm, we're going to start here on our um, Stanford team, and I'll just go down by state. Um, once again, I'm Dr. Nick Cutris, Pediatric Endocrinologist and Program Director, um, and uh, Linda. Hi, I'm Linda Baer, and I'm the Director of Education for this ECHO. I also have had type 1 diabetes for 49 years, and I'm delighted you could all join us today. Thanks so much. Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Town, and I am the program coordinator, and I have had type 1 diabetes for 30 years, and I'm a nurse and a diabetes educator. Um, and from our Stanford Hub team in California, Marina. Hi, I'm Marina Bessina, adult endocrinology, and welcome to our weekly session. And Magdalena. Hi, I'm Magdalena Ford, and I'm a family nurse practitioner with Stanford's Adult Endocrine Team. It's nice to see everyone today. And Corey. Hi, everyone. My name is Corey Hood. I'm a psychologist and professor at Stanford University. And Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse Wong, and I'm a diabetes psychologist at Stanford University. And also in California, Jay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jay Shubrook, a family physician and primary care diabetologist at Torrey University of California. Also in California, Kelly. Hello, my name is Kelly Close. I'm a patient representative in this group, and I'm an editor at diatribe.org. I've had diabetes for nearly 35 years. And over to Hawaii, Dan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Saltman. I'm a primary care internist, uh, mainly working at community health centers and a, uh, an associate clinical professor at the University of Hawaii School of Medicine. Thank you. And to Iowa, Dave. Hi, my name is Dave Faldmo. I'm a family practice PA at the Siouxland Community Health Center in Sioux City, Iowa, and also the quality director here and work with our uh, diabetes education program. And to Louisiana, Dragana. Hi, everyone. I'm Dragana Lovre. I'm an adult endocrinologist at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. And in Maine, uh, Erwin. Hi, I'm Erwin Brodsky. I'm an adult endocrinologist at um, the Endocrinology and Diabetes Center at Maine Medical Center and an adjunct scientist at Maine Medical Center Research Institute. And to Massachusetts, Samar. Hi everyone, I'm Summer. I'm an adult endocrinologist here at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston, Massachusetts. And Nebraska, Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Island. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, and I also have type 1 diabetes. And New Jersey, Mary. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Bridgman. I'm a clinical professor at the School of Pharmacy at Rutgers University and a clinical pharmacist at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick. And to the Echo Institute in New Mexico, Matt. Hi there, Matt Bishonville. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of New Mexico. Good to see you all. And to New York, Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Desimone. I'm an adult endocrinologist at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. And to Washington, Savita. Hi, I'm Savita Subramanian. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of Washington in Seattle. Great, thank you all for introducing yourselves. I'm going to um, now reshare my sque screen um, and we're gonna move on um, to um, high impact follow-up questions from last week. So each week we um, uh, pick some uh, questions that have been coming into the, the QA box. Um, and lots of questions came in last week on what, are re what resources are available for patients with diabetes during the time of COVID. 
Um, and just a reminder on our, if you go to our website, website diabetescovid.stanford.edu, you can see on the right side, um, circled in blue, highlighted in red, diabetes in the time of COVID-19 resources PDF. Um, if you click on that, you will um, get these resources with hyperlinks. We continue to upper, um, update these links. Um, and just to call out, there was lots of questions regarding insulin and medication supplies. Uh, the American Diabetes Association has a emergency hotline that's uh, noted there. Um, and then each major manu insulin manufacturer also has copay assistance uh, programs available um, and other um, non-insulin medications. There is also um, financial assistance. So um, encourage you to go back and, and, um, and, and look at that as well. Um, and once again, as uh, mentioned last week, um, Diatribe also has excellent uh, patient-centered resources available um, on their uh, website, um, and that link is also um, from that uh, previous one-pager that, uh, that I shared. Um, and finally, um, uh, diabeteswise.org, they're conducting um, a weekly uh, panel discussions, um, and this is an example of uh, today's um, um, a topic and each week there'll be new topics. So encourage you to share this um, with your patients and even as a provider, um, uh, you're welcome to join as well. Uh, we'll now move on to the speaker portion of the webinar. This week's speaker is Dr. Bob G Robert Gabay. Um, Dr. Gabay is Chief Scientific and Medical Officer at the Med American uh, Diabetes Association and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on innovative models of diabetes care to improve and enhance diabetes outcomes for the lives of people living with diabetes. To meet these goals, he has traversed many areas, including an initial career as a basic scientist, researcher, to development of better patient communication tools, creating the first broad scale diabetes registry, designing and implementing a care management training program, leading the Pennsylvania statewide implementation of patients at a medical home and defining the, med uh, the medical neighborhood and the role of centers of excellence in diabetes, envisioning the digital health of the uh, latest member of the diabetes team. Dr. Gabay has received funding from the National Institute of Health and IDBK, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AR, AHRQ and the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation for his care transformation work. Along with an extensive peer reviewed publication record, his views have appeared in popular press such as New York Times, CNN, Oprah, and the Washington Post and NPR. Bob is an uh, advocate for uh, ECHO and, uh, and spearheaded their uh, Jocelyn Diabetes ECHO uh, program. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to pass over the screen sharing um, to you. Uh, and as Dr. Gabay pulls up his um, screen, as a reminder, if you have questions regarding to uh, the presentation, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A. Our faculty will uh, respond. Um, and if you have um, resources to share, please put them in the uh, chat box. Thanks so much, Dr. Gabay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, and uh, what a lovely introduction, and great to see so many colleagues and all of you joining. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, what I'm going to walk you through is uh, this idea of therapeutic inertia and how uh, we uh, collectively can work to tackle this, and in the process, share a bit about the American Diabetes Association standards of care as some updates from that uh, I am a week into my new job and uh, couldn't be more pleased to be here with you today. Um, I don't have any relevant uh, disclosures. So uh, many of you probably know that the, uh, the ADA produces this standards of medical care and diabetes. This is uh, really the definitive guidelines around diabetes that are followed uh, around the world. Um, and one of the things that uh, happened in 2018 is because of the rapid changes in diabetes and the number of important studies, really there's been an acceleration of medical knowledge around diabetes, the, the document became a living document. In other words, not only is it produced every year, but there are updates as new information comes. And 
You can see the website here. I encourage you to go to it. It's free. There's uh, lots of information about um, in-depth aspects of uh, really everything around diabetes all in one place. So again, I encourage you to take a look at that. What I want to sort of frame and zoom out a little bit is, is a little bit of the history of diabetes. And so if, if we think about what's happened over the years in terms of treatment, and then I'll focus more specifically around the last 20 years, this, this sort of gives you a timeline. And you, you can see that, you know, uh, on the left, uh, we're coming up to the 100 year anniversary of the discovery of insulin. That uh, then was uh, followed really many years later by the uh, uh, availability of sulfonylureas introduced. Um, the American Diabetes Association didn't start publishing its guidelines uh, on, until 1989. And from 1990 on, you can see this steady uh, introduction of new treatments for diabetes. Really, um, probably, uh, it's hard to think of another disease that has had so many new classes of drugs, and each of them really uh, very important, you know, starting with metformin, alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, the availability of rapid acting analogs of insulin, then basal insulin, the maglutinides, the GLP-1 agonists, pramlatide, DPP-4s, it'll be a subject. Uh, next uh, session, bromocryptine and SGLT-2s, it'll be also talked about next week. All of these things are really remarkable. Uh, and so the question is, with all of this advancement, particularly over these last 20 years, you see there's been an acceleration what, what's happened in terms of care, and, and Nick alluded to this earlier, um, you know, this is a, a, not only have these advances happened, but if you look at the top of this graph, there have been a number of sort of changes in health technology and policy that also should have really made a big difference, you know, whether that's um, starting with the, uh, uh, the the availability of electronic health records that are now ubiquitous and the funding that went into that, the Affordable Care Act that ensured more people, uh, meaningful use, uh, the uh, implementation of the patient center medical home, something that I've done a lot of research on and been very interested in, uh, accountable care organizations, um, you know, all of this. And, and you look at what's happened nationally with the A1C percent of people at goal and green and the percent of people with an A1C greater than nine. And although those absolute numbers will depend on which population you look at, you can sort of see there's really been not a lot of change, which is pretty discouraging. And so, although yes, we need new treatments and these policy changes are really important, we're missing something. And, and so the question is, why are we not getting any better despite all of this amazing changes in healthcare? And uh, again, Nick alluded to this at the beginning, there are a series of system related issues and I'm gonna focus on, on a broad area around this and that's therapeutic inertia. So um, what is, what is you know, therapeutic inertia I would argue is in part responsible for the failure to meet these goals. And, and we would define that, that concept of therapeutic inertia as the failure to advance or de-intensify, and I'll talk about de-intensifying later, um, the treatment regimen when a patient's therapeutic goals are not met. So a uh, common scenario, patient uh, individual with diabetes has a high A1C, they come in and there's no change in therapy. And we'll get to the root causes of this in a moment and try to figure out, but that that seems to be a big part of why there's been no change in um, A1C and, uh, and a percent of individuals meeting goals despite all the new therapies. So um, one, one concept I want to introduce, this idea of metabolic memory. So it turns out that what you do early in the course of disease, and my comments are going to focus primarily on type 2 diabetes. Some of these concepts around therapeutic inertia certainly apply to type 1. Um, given that this is largely a primary care uh, group, we'll, we'll focus mostly on type 2 and sort of the evidence about metabolic memory, and I'll define what that is in a moment. But it, it's, it, what, what seems to be the case is the control early on really makes a difference. 
Um, and so in this slide, it's a bit of a complicated slide, but if you focus initially on the left-hand side of the slide, and th this is uh, data from what was basically the study that proved that better glucose control could prevent complications of diabetes in people with type 2 diabetes. So this was the what's called the UKPDS study. And you can see there are two arms, um, and one had higher A1C and one had lower A1C goals. And the finding at the end of this decade of study that you know uh, culminated in 1997 when it was reported out was that people in the better glucose control group had fewer complications than those that with the higher glucose control goals and so that really was a paradigm shifting change we had proof to have better glucose control and we all started doing that well they followed these people they were no longer in the study but they followed them over time and if you can see the after the dotted line on the right hand side, and I don't know if my pointer shows up, but you can see that they roughly both had the same A1C over the ensuing uh, decade. So there was a difference in A1C early, but then over many years uh, after that, they had the same A1C. And still there was a legacy effect. That group that had better A1C in that first decade had a significant reduction, 24% reduction in microvascular disease. Um, uh, you can see 15% in, in MI and also reduction in all-cause mortality. So there was some memory of the fact that they had better control, you know, a decade earlier that still improved their uh, outcomes uh, long-term. And so this is not only true in this legacy effect of good glucose control early, <clears throat> predicting what would happen down the line in terms of complications. But this is also true in a, in a large database, sort of real world database. And you can see here uh, that those that had better glucose control in that first year after diagnosis had a reduction, had lower all-cause mortality and more, and lower micro and macrovascular complications. So the, the teaching out of this is um, that glucose control in the early years has benefit down the line, and therefore that's an important area to focus. So uh, this idea of therapeutic inertia that I described, um, does it really exist? Uh, well, we know that A1C hasn't changed, but um, is this the reason why, or is this a contributor? Well, this, this summarizes a lot of data schematically. Um, and basically, as you know, our, our typical paradigm for managing uh, people with type 2 diabetes is we start with one oral any hypoglycemic agent, and then we move to the, when, they, when they fail that, they move to a second agent, a third agent, and then insulin and, and or GLP-1 sort of added along. Well, this is the gap. Uh, the number of years that people go not at goal after each of these interventions. And you can see it's years before the next step happens. It's years, you know, one and a half to almost three years before the second agent and, and so forth. And so there are these really long gaps. And those gaps are probably a big part of why we haven't really been able to make improvements uh, in A1C over time, because people are living outside a goal for so long before the next agent is started. <clears throat> so um, therapeutic inertia is real. It happens. Uh, we have data to show that. We have data to show that early on, um, if you do the right thing, if, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, all of us work together uh, with our patients to get to goal early. They have fewer complications later on. There's that legacy effect. So what are the contributing factors to therapeutic inertia? And the ADA has really taken a lead in diving into this. We brought a group of experts, a multi-stakeholder group, some of the people that are part of the Endo Echo, the uh, 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 Diabetes Echo here or, were uh, important members of that. And we really sort of try to catalog 
that plus the literature of what are the contributing factors. And there are many, um, but I'll, I'll try to walk you through this. So, you know, um, it's, it's not all about any one group. So there, you know, some of this is around people with diabetes. Uh, let me start by saying none of this is about blaming any of these uh, uh, groups, but really there, there are factors in each of these groups that need to be addressed, and I'll talk about them in a moment. So there are factors around people with diabetes, around clinicians and healthcare providers, the healthcare system, their system issues, there are payer issues and, and industry issues. I'm gonna focus for our audience on the first three, because those are the things that we collectively have some ability to be able to work on. Certainly on an advocacy level, the ADA is working with our partners, uh, payer partners in industry to try to tackle this as well. So this is a busy slide in part because there are many reasons uh, uh, but I'll, I'll try to highlight what I think are some of the most important. So if, if you think of the clinic, uh, clinician related issues, you know, as you ask clinicians, insufficient time is clearly a, a, a barrier. Um, the, you know, we, there's observation that often there are not clear therapeutic goals, uh, that failure uh, to initiate therapy in an early time, I showed you some of that data, the delays, uh, the delay in titrating treatment to achieve goal. And then there's a host of other things here. Uh, you know, everyone may not agree with the guidelines. Uh, they may not identify the comorbidities. There may be barriers and, uh, uh, you know, there are many others, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll focus on, on things that sort of relate to our individuals with diabetes. Often they may have a poor understanding of diabetes and that it is progressive, that that is the natural history. They also have <clears throat> very significant social determinants of health. Uh, depression is very common. Substance abuse can be a significant barrier. All of those feed into the disparities in healthcare that were mentioned earlier on. And I'll, I'll circle back to that in a few minutes. Uh, medication side effects, particularly hypoglycemia and weight gain, and, and poor communication sometimes between us as the healthcare team and patients. And again, cost is a factor. Um, you know, some people are in denial. There's a whole host of issues uh, that, that can contribute to therapeutic inertia. And then on the system side, uh, and I think you, you know, uh, there is, there are some competing and unclear clinical guidelines. This is where the ADA is trying to step in, and we've worked with other organizations, for example, our colleagues in Europe. We now, our guidelines are often joint guidelines by the ADA and the European Association of the Study of Diabetes. We've partnered with the American Heart Association to try to have harmony between guidelines. Uh, there is not always transparency at the point of care in terms of formulary. I'm sure you've run into this. Uh, I want to prescribe a drug and I'm not 100% sure whether that drug will be on the patient's formulary and that causes a lot of challenges. Uh, they go, they figure out it's not on the formulary, I don't find out until the next time they have a visit, et cetera, et cetera. Limited access to diabetes educators or diabetes care uh, uh, an education specialist, the new terminology for them, uh, and not always having a team-based approach. So let me talk a, a couple of minutes about this idea. I said that therapeutic inertia might be not intensifying, but also sometimes not de-intensifying or simplifying therapy. And maybe simplifying therapy is the better terminology here. And, and you can imagine one group where this is fairly obvious, and this is in older adults. And so this is from the uh, ADA clinical guidelines around older adults. And, and I think this makes a lot of sense. So you can imagine older adults who are otherwise healthy, uh, have few chronic illnesses and intact cognition and function. They should have lower goals and their goals should be similar almost to everybody else. They have a life expectancy of greater than five years and therefore you wanna to try to prevent complications in those. But those with multiple uh, coexisting chronic illnesses and particularly cognitive impairment and functional dependency, 
those people should have less stringent goals and higher A1C. And, and really the key, the reason we want to do this is to minimize particularly hypoglycemia, which is a big issue in this population. Is that actually responsible for more emergency department admissions for this age group than hyperglycemia. So in this group that are older and increased risk of hypoglycemia, it makes sense to use medications that have lower risk of hypoglycemia. In, in, in other words, trying to avoid sulfonylureas. Overtreatment is common, as I said, and really need to be avoided. And deintensification, simplifying therapy can really be advantageous. And there are a number of protocols of how to do this. Uh, uh, again, you can refer to the ADA guidelines for this, but it's taking people off of basal bolus therapy, for example, and simplifying their regimen, minimizing the number of different drugs, using combination therapy, all of these strategies to make things simpler so that it's more likely they can be adherent and have less errors. Okay, so I want to finish off now with what can we do to overcome therapeutic inertia? And I'm going to give you a menu of different options here. <clears throat> so here, here are five broad categories. Uh, one uh, starts like any other problem is identifying the patients that are likely to have therapeutic inertia. And I'll walk you some ideas there. Then optimizing the workflow in the office. Uh, developing a personalized care plan that really addresses social determinants of health. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, developing a team is really the key thing. And, you know, particularly for the uh, physicians uh, that are on the, the, this uh, session, really it's not all about us. That's the old model. It's really we practice as part of a team and engaging those team members. And then utilizing glucose data to make medication adjustments, not just waiting for the A1C. So let me walk through each of these quickly. First of all, how do you go identifying potential uh, therapeutic inertia candidates? It starts with your electronic health record. Most are able to identify through DRG code or some other way the individuals that have type 2 diabetes. If you don't and you're using a paper chart, you know, this work was done before electronic health records. Put, it, put a, a colored sticker on it that will represent this person has diabetes. And then an easy place to start is try to identify a list of patients that have a high A1C, greater than nine, it may be a higher number, but have not been in for six months. By definition, they're a group at high risk that need to uh, have some care. And then bringing those people back and then having having some ongoing follow-up where you can engage these people. Uh, this again is where you can empower office staff and others to help accomplish this goal and bring people in. Uh, and, and it really starts with uh, engaging people with diabetes about therapeutic inertia, that this is an issue, it's a challenge, it's a progressive disease. We're gonna need to work together to figure out how to solve this and understanding where they're coming from, and I'll, I'll allude to that in a moment. In terms of optimizing workflow, there are a number of different strategies. Uh, one is to you know, modify and titrate treatment based on glucose values and not just waiting for the A1C. More frequent visits when patients are not at goal, and of course, less frequent visits when they are at goal. Um, we're all using remote uh, uh, patient monitoring now more and more, and certainly virtual visits, having patients being able to send their glucose values to you to have titration of their medication is an important piece. And again, this is a great place to bring the, the team in. This isn't all about the uh, uh, primary care provider, but it's other team members that can help in this. And identify community partners where you can refer patients to for uh, needed services. Uh, a, a third sort of bucket of strategies are around personalizing the care plan, discussing the progressive nature of type 2 diabetes, reinforcing um, uh, the connection between getting goals early, uh, that metabolic memory idea, and long-term health, uh, 
setting goals together. And I can't emphasize how important that is to talk through what is, what is a goal for you. Here's what we know about preventing complications. What, where should we try to strive for? And then evaluating and addressing uh, barriers, open-ended questions to understand the challenges people with diabetes face. Uh, and don't forget about depression because about 30% of people with type 2 diabetes have depression. If we don't screen for it, we're not gonna know about it. And then referring for diabetes self-management education and community resources, uh, a severely underutilized part of the healthcare team. And again, looking at that glucose data. Um, then finally, getting, having the community and, and your educators as part of the team. Get to know who they are. Uh, you may have local pharmacists that can be part of the team and do some work around medication adherence. Uh, community health workers, if you have access to them, uh, health plan care managers, all these other people in the ecosystem that can help engage individuals with diabetes and help them. And really, you know, uh, now more than ever, redoubling our efforts to address health disparities. And I'll, I'll just take a, a very brief detour on that. So, you know, there are hugely recognized health disparities uh, around diabetes. And, you know, here are just some quick statistics. If you look at sort of non-Hispanic whites, it's only 7.5% of the population on the left-hand side of the slide. But you look at Asian Americans, Hispanics, non-Hispanic Blacks, uh, uh, American Indians, uh, uh, and Alaska Natives. Uh, again, all of these have much higher risks of diabetes, uh, have higher complication rates. I think one of the staggering statistics I heard was the uh, the subway health disparity in New York. In Bronx, you uh, have, you're likely to live 10 years less than a few st subway stops away in uh, Manhattan in New York. 10 years difference of life expectancy, unacceptable and something we need to do something about. Social determinants of health are fueling these disparities. Um, and, and we're well aware of many of these issues around access and cost, uh, substance abuse. There are some biological factors that increase the risk of developing diabetes and of course lifestyle factors, but it's hard to have the right lifestyle when you don't have access to the right foods, for example, live in a food desert. Uh, I wanna call your attention to this website on the left uh, that has cataloged uh, a great amount of community resources that many of us in the healthcare world often are unaware of. And so I encourage you to sort of take advantage of that. Uh, also on the right-hand side tomorrow, there is a, a free webinar from ADA that is looking at dealing with the issues of uh, food insecurity that often drive a lot of the worst outcomes uh, uh, in these populations that have uh, worse outcomes. So finally, uh, it's utilizing the data to make medication adjustments, whether that's self-monitored glucose values or the availability of continuous glucose monitors that can be done just for short periods of time to figure out the time and range and be able to make adjustments. But the goal here is really to make adjustments more frequently uh, using glucose data and not waiting for A1C. So at the end, really, it's, you know, ask yourself, uh, do I feel reasonably certain that I've done everything within my sphere control? Because recognize there are lots of things we don't control as healthcare uh, uh, clinicians to help patients optimize uh, therapy and remove the barriers to achieve the, the goals. Really think about how you can bust barriers. First, you've got to understand what they are, then you've got to start uh, addressing them. So I will end to summarize uh, what I uh, know I threw a lot of information at, but I'm uh, glad to answer questions. First, this idea of therapeutic inertia is the failure to advance or de-intensify or simplify uh, therapeutic regimens when a patient's not at goal. Um, and I remind you of that early glycemic control 
has a legacy effect uh, to prevent impact in poor outcomes down the line. So that first year after diagnosis is really important. Uh, and then addressing the patient practice and system components that uh, are at the root of therapeutic inertia. A few things that you can think about in your practice and perhaps you can try tomorrow. Here's a, a list to think about. Some of you may do some of these better than others, but here's a quick list to think about. Uh, are you already identifying and engaging patients with likely therapeutic inertia in your practice? Finding those people that have an A1C greater than nine and not had an office visit in six months, do outreach. Have more frequent visits for people that are not doing well and take advantage of now that we have, uh, uh, for most of us, uh, reimbursement for telehealth and virtual visits. Refer more patients to diabetes self-management education. I can't emphasize enough how these individuals know how to uh, remove barriers, how to problem solve and engage people with diabetes, and often have the time that some of us don't have in our busy practice. Setting agreed upon goals uh, with the individual with diabetes so they understand what the goal is. Use glucose data along with A1C to make titrations. And again, the uh, full details of management of diabetes, um, which obviously I can't, couldn't cover it on this, this amount of time, are downloadable for free and uh, uh, have that information. And again, with regular updates. And with that, uh, thank you so much for listening uh, and being part of this and uh, being committed to making a difference in the lives of people with diabetes. And uh, glad to answer some questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Bob. That was excellent. And, and thank you all for um, uh, listening and, and also contributing to questions during the, the presentation. There was um, um, great dialogue um, going on in the, the chat box. And if you have any additional questions right now for Dr. Gabay, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A. And maybe I'll open it up to our faculty as well, just to maybe bring up um, some of the questions that, that, that came in um, during the presentation um, that might be uh, nice to highlight right now. Dr. Gabay, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, there was some discussion about what makes a patient elderly and how do we define that? That's a great question. So I, I, I think that the best way to think about this is really around life expectancy. Uh, so uh, you can have an 80 year old person uh, that is healthy and vigorous. And I think we all know these people. Uh, they have a, a good life expectancy and they should be treated. It's not an age thing. On the other hand, you may have a 65-year-old with multiple comorbidities uh, that have, uh, really have a, a limited life expectancy, and those individuals should really have uh, uh, um, higher glycemic goals and are, el are the kinds of people we think about simplifying therapy. So really getting a, a sense of comorbidities, cognitive function uh, uh, is, is uh, probably the best way to do that. If I could just Great. mention one other thing, uh, uh, just, uh, you know, since I'm a week into my new role and make a shameless plug, this effort around therapeutic inertia is about to launch nationally in a much bigger way. And so you'll be hearing much more about this from the ADA, and we've partnered with a number of organizations to do this. Uh, and many of the folks that are uh, uh, part of this, uh, uh, this effort uh, uh, today, uh, because we really think this is how we can move the needle uh, as, a, as a country and, and beyond to be able to improve outcomes for people with diabetes. So stay tuned for more. And, and there was also some uh, questions that came up um, on the legacy effect um, and also looking at the um, specific VA population. Um, uh, Jay, you'd respond to that comment. I don't know if you want to um, um, maybe summarize some of the conversation that was happening there. And, and then Bob, if you want to comment some more on that. Oh, just about the effects of legacy early versus late? Yeah. So um, I think it's really question important that came up. for us to know that 
Um, the earlier we act, probably the more benefit you're going to get downstream. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't act later. It just means that the more damage that's been done in the background, the less uh, gains you can recoup. And, and you know, we all remember the studies in 2008 where there was a lot of challenge to intensive glucose control, but that was largely focused on macrovascular disease. All of our patients tend to benefit from better glucose control from microvascular disease. We just really, for the thing that kills most people with diabetes, we got to address it early in the disease and not wait till it becomes more serious. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I, I would add that, you know, for those that uh, sort of recall that VA study, you know, the, these were people with really advanced disease. And that was part of the lesson is that you really want to go upstream. The other big lesson out of that and, and other studies like the court was um, what was really bad was hypoglycemia. And thinking about avoiding hypoglycemia is critical. So we, 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 we still believe that if you had good glucose control without hypoglycemia, those same people probably would have benefited. But the tools that were available in those studies did not, you know, they, they weren't the things that we have now. Thanks. And um, additional questions continue to come in and, and we'll, uh, we'll reply to them. Um, and there's some um, questions asking about uh, the ADA's uh, webinar tomorrow on food insecurity. We'll put that into the chat box. There's some questions on time and range versus A1C. We um, to remind, we have a uh, on-demand recording on that. I think all of us here on this panel could talk for two hours or, or two days on um, the benefits of, of looking at time and range beyond A1C. Um, I don't know if you have any other uh, comments on that, Bob, but we can um, put some other comments, um, uh, resources there as well. I think time and range is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and as you're right, we could go on for two days. Um, a question was asked about for patients with diabetes and hypertension, are there particular medications that should be avoided such as ACE inhibitors and, and ARBs? Um, and now there's some um, new press coming out about captopril. So we previously addressed this question, but now with captopril, wanted to readdress it. Um, and Rehan had uh, prepared um, um, some responses. So Rehan, I'm gonna just share the screen and pass it over to you to speak. Thanks, Nick. So in general, I think we had talked about ACEs and ARBs sort of being this balancing act. Uh, in, in animal studies for a lot of this, these medications, in addition, uh, TZDs and ibuprofen increase ACE2 uh, and COVID-19 spike proteins bind to ACE2. So there's a hypothesized increase in your susceptibility to infection. Um, if one is on these medications. However, ACE2 also catalyzes this conversion of angiotensin II to the uh, inactive vasodilatory angiotensin 1-7, um, which is supposedly lung protective. So in theory, you also have a hypothesized protection against uh, ARDS if you are infected. So the question is your susceptibility to infection weighed against your protection if you are infected. Um, and next slide, Nick. So in this situation, um, the, uh, the AHFSA, ACC, and AHA uh, didn't know which direction to go one way or the other. So we sort of said, well, leave people where they are at. Um, for the time being and don't don't take somebody off if they're already on it. Um, so stay the course. And some new data was presented very recently. Uh, Nick, next slide. So um, here we have uh, Captopril. And uh, in this observational study from a cohort um, in, uh, in Kansas, they had uh, captopril uh, causing potentially more adverse pulmonary events than the other members of this drug class. So one thing to keep in mind is just that not all members of a drug class may act the same way. And we have to really keep that in mind because if one were to analyze everything as a big set, 
you might erroneously conclude that because of one outlier in that set that everything has that same conclusion. So this was the first observational study to show that maybe there are differences amongst ACE inhibitors. Um, and of course, there are so many confounders and third variables here which could interfere. Perhaps captopril being the oldest ACE inhibitor, maybe people who are getting captopril were subjected to sort of older elements of care or something like that. You could hypothesize a lot of things, but I think the, uh, the situation is just one where one has to be mindful that not all drugs of a class act exactly the same way.